go to Genesis chapter 13. Verse 2. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. Amplified Bible says he was extremely rich in livestock and in silver and in gold. Now look at the end. Look at, let's look at the end of Abram's life. Genesis 24. And Abram was old <laughs> and well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abram in all things. Now Galatians chapter 3 verse 29 says the following. If we belong to Christ, then are we Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay? If you belong to Christ, you are Abram's seed and you are an heir according to the promise. So that brings us to point number one. You've got a promise to be very great. Now remember, if you belong to Christ, you are the seed to whom the promise is made. God promised you to be blessed. Your name to be very great. And if that happened to Ab Abram, it'll happen to you too. Extremely rich. In all things. Okay? If you don't have a lot of cattle. And gold. And silver. Okay? Point number one. God promised you to be blessed. Okay? So if we want to throw in a few scriptures there tonight for the, all those poor looking ones. There's a scripture in 3 John says the following. Beloved. I wish above all things that you may prosper. Okay, do you know what the word prosper means? It means prosper. Okay, you turn it around anyway, it still means prosper. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in good health, even as our soul prosper. So God wants you blessed. God wants you to prosper. Okay, here comes John chapter 10. You know, Jesus says, you know, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd will lay down his life for his sheep. You know, in other words, Jesus, I will die for you. Jesus says, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So let's go to point number two, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Remember in Ephesians 2 verse 8, it says, by grace are ye saved. So point number two, to get your financial breakthrough and blessing, you must receive his grace. Receive his grace. In what fashion? Uh, chapter 8 verse 9. For you know the grace of of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich. Yet for your sakes he became poor. That you through his poverty. Might be rich. He became poor. Oh man. I hope you're going to see you there. You there. Jesus became poor so that you look at verse 7 therefore he's talking about the giving as you abound in everything in faith in utterance that's speaking and knowledge in all diligence and your love see that you also abound in this grace what is this grace it says you must receive the fact that Christ by grace became very poor and died on the cross so that you through his death might be made very, very rich. Abram was rich in cattle, rich in silver, and rich in gold. Rich means rich. But in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus, now let me tell you, you look at these lilies, see that bird, see? Solomon in all his glory, the one translation that I have here would say, in all his riches, was not even clothed like these lilies. How much more will God do for you? The context. Oh, so go back to Genesis. We're back at Abram. Genesis 14 this time. 
And when, verse 14, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants by night, and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods, and the woman also, and the people. And the king of Solomon went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedorlaomer, and the kings that were with him at the the valley of Shava, that is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, everybody says Melchizedek. Melchizedek, the king of Salem, which brought forth bread and wine. Now we all know what bread and wine stands for. It stands about the table of the Lord. The Bible says the night the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread and broke it. And he thanked God and he gave it out said, this is my body broken for you. Then he took the wine and he said, this is the New Testament in my blood. Oh man. So here comes Melchizedek out of nowhere, appears unto Abraham and he brought forth bread and wine. Now the Bible says in Galatians 3 verse 8, the gospel was first preached unto Abraham. Now here's Abram 400 years before the law, thousands of years before grace came in. And here sits Abraham and here comes Melchizedek and he break bread. He said, this is my body, Abram. I want to bring you the gospel. You're the first one to get the gospel. Here is my body broken for you. Abram, here is the cup. Drink it. This will be the New Testament in my blood. No way. Let's just take there. Okay? And he blessed him. Oh, thank you. And he said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Come on. Wow. And blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered thine enemies into thy hand. Yes. And Abram gave him a tithe of all that he got. Okay. 15 verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, and I am your exceeding great reward. Who, 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 who. When Abram found out Melchizedek preached the gospel to him, the first thing he did, he tithed. Do you know what a tithe is? If you have hundred, it's ten. If you have thousand, it's hundred. You know what a tithe is? God was so clever, he worked the Bible out in the metric way. So you don't have to struggle. Who is this Melchizedek? Go to Hebrews 7 and find out how you can be blessed financially. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abram returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abram gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation. Now listen to this if you want to get the New Testament. King of righteousness. And after that, he's also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Okay, isn't he called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace? Verse 3, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abide a priest continually. Now people say, oh, because he was just like the Son of God. Did you know that Daniel said he was like the Son of God? Did you know that John on the Isle of Patmos said he saw somebody like the Son of God? Okay, I just want you to get biblical terminology. Daniel, when he saw him, when the king saw the fourth man, when uh, John saw him in the Isle of Patmos, when Ezekiel saw him, how, how did he see Jesus? He said, I saw somebody like the Son of God. Like unto the Son of God. Okay, so he says, what is this Melchizedek? He is Jesus Christ. He's not a type of Jesus Christ. There's not another one that's got no descent. There's not another one without beginning of days and without ending of days. Do you think God has two sons? Why the tithe? I don't know, where did Abram got it? Have you ever thought? I don't know. But where do we get it? Oh, we get it in the book. Because it's written that Abram gave. Then it's written Melchizedek is now a priest. And it's written Melchizedek received tithes. Point number four. God wants to restore All 
all you suppose to have. And even more. That you ever had. Why, Kubis? Because in Genesis chapter 20, oh no, Exodus chapter 22, the word of the Lord comes and says, If anything has been taken away from you, it must be restored double. If the thief is found, it must be given back to you fourfold, but never less than double. So go to the book of Joel, verse 24. Are you there? And the floors shall be full of wheat. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you that the years that the locust have eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palm worm, my great army which are sent among, and you shall eat in plenty and shall be satisfied and you shall be never ashamed. So God says, I want to restore. Now, our best example still stays, still stays Uncle Job. Job chapter 1. Look at verse 3. His substance was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen. That means 1,000. 500 she donkeys. Because the other word can come out wrong. And very great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men in the East. Okay? The word great there is rich. This man had 7,000 sheep, 10,000, you know? 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 sea donkeys. Verse 5. No, we can't read verse 5 now. Just look here. Just look here. Do you think he was rich? The Bible says he was greatest in the East. You know what the East is today? There's a lot of oil there. Hmm? There's a lot of islands that they even built by themselves there. Hmm? There's a lot of stuff, you know, the, the sheikhs and the Muhammad Khama Ali Khesh come all come from the East. <laughs> they are all from the East. Now, if you are the richest amongst them, Yay. Yay. Can we have any word from any other language? That's, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, that's Bikiricho. Okay? Okay? But then, you know, you know, Satan intervened and came in between, and, you know, Job started losing everything. And before long, he was sitting on the ash heap, scraping himself, and, you know, the dogs came and licked his sores, and his wife left him, his children, you know, those that didn't die left him. And Job was all alone except for three friends that came and prophesied to him at times, and at times, really, you know, the prophecies was hard at times. Sometimes it was good. And then in Job chapter 8, these friends came to him and said, Job, God says you must think back to your beginning. Remember when you were the richest man in the East? God says, that was small to what is coming. God says, your latter days will greatly increase. It'll be much more than you had there. Job said, oh. Yeah, I can hear you now. I'm sitting on the ash heap. And then the Bible goes on in Job chapter 8 and says, Job, when this comes and God will turn your captivity, your mouth will be filled with laughter. In other words, you will be sitting laughing about this because you will not be able to believe it. Now, that's a true word in Psalm 126. It says, when God turns the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. And our mouths were filled with laughter, you know. So, uh, say, the time has come for me to rejoice. So, I'm so close to being hysterical. It's just not true. Okay, that means God's going to turn your captivity and you're going to have a flood tidal wave of turning around and your poverty is going to be turned to prosperity. Your poorness is going to be turned to richness. Your lack's going to be turned into overflow. Your salt is going to be turned into plenty. God is about to bless you. Did it happen, Kubis? Keep your finger in Job chapter 1 and go to Job 42. Okay, verse 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. When he prayed for his friends, 
We get the praying part now, now, because it's not what you think. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Okay? Restoration. Are you in both chapters? Look at chapter 1. He had 7,000 sheep. Look at verse 12 of 42. He had 14,000 sheep. Look at chapter 1, verse 3. He had 3,000. Are you there? Camels. Now he has 6,000. He had 500 yoke of oxen. Now he has 1,000 yoke of oxen. He had 500 she donkeys. Now he has 1,000. Don't you think that's good restoration? Do you want to get the full story? Keep chapter 1 open. Let's read chapter 42. Then Job said to the Lord. That's chapter 42. Now you must know, the whole book of Job, Job complained a lot. About everything that he had and hasn't got. Then Job answered the Lord. I know that you can do all things. And that no thought can be withholden from you. In other words, whatever I think you know already. Who is he that hide counsel without knowledge? Therefore, listen to this. Have I uttered that I understood not? I said things that was too wonderful for me, which I knew not. I hope you can see this. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare unto me. I have heard of you by hearing of the ear, but now my eye have seen you. Now verse 6. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Okay, does anybody know the different meanings of the word repent? It means change your mind. It means returning to the highest point. It means doing the first works. Okay, remember in Revelation 2 where Jesus says, uh, you know, I've got something against you that you've left your first love. So repent and do your first works. So repent means do your first. Repent also means mean when you go to a high building, there's a little building on the top where the caretaker stays called the penthouse. It means the highest place. So repent is go back to the highest place you ever had. So repent means change your mind, do the stuff that you did at first, and return to the highest point you had before you backslid. Is that all right? Okay, before we read on, chapter 1. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone out, Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings, According to the number of his sons, for Job said, it might be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And thus did Job continually. Okay, look at me. Why did Job offer sacrifices? Because he said, maybe my son said something against God. So I better bring sacrifices and I better offer burnt offerings so that God will be pleased with my offerings that he will not smite my sons. What did Job do for 42 chapters? He blamed God. So what did he do when he repented? If this is what he did in the beginning, for in case somebody said something about God, what did he do in his repentance? He must have brought an offering. I'll prove it to you. Back in chapter 42, I'll prove it to you. And it was so, verse 7, that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said, You know, my wrath is kindled against you. That is his prophet's friends. And against your two friends. For you have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job has. Now I want you to go read through Job. They spoken more good about God than Job did. They tried to help God, Job, to get back on place. And Job, Job didn't. Now God says, my servant Job is right and you are wrong. Why? Because Job already repented. Now I say, by implication, he must have offered Because that's what he did in chapter 1. So now if these guys are now worse than Job, because God says so, and Job is now righteous, but he mowed more than them, let's look at the rest. So God says, verse 8, Therefore take now seven bullocks, seven rams, go to my servant Job and offer up, and my servant Job shall pray for you. Then God turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. So the the context is there. There must have been offerings on both sides. And that is why Job couldn't pray for them because they have not yet brought his offering. But Job was already accepted by God because Job already brought his offering. To get your restoration, what about 
bring an offer. To qualify your restoration. This is a principle that I've applied without even knowing the word. If I've lost something, or a car got damaged, you know, we had accidents, by the way, and we smashed up cars, by the way, and just some stuff has been stolen from us. You know, I had a big camera, the camera was stolen, so I said, Lord, I'm going to get a better camera. So God says, what about, what are you going to put in the ground for the better camera? So I said, I'm going to bring an offering Sunday so that I can get a better camera during the week. Okay, you don't understand, but I'm trying to bring you a principle that I did my life long without even knowing the word it was there. Job brought an offering and he got his restoration. How many stuff of yours have been stolen, taken away, damaged, they broke in, they smashed your car up, they took your stuff out? How, what did you do about it? You complained and you went to the insurance agency. How many ever thought of, man, I'm going to put 200 rand in the offering on Sunday and this is going to be to get my restoration? Why would you do such a thing? Because it's written. God wants you to prosper. Even in times of famine. When the whole country is drought stricken, poverty stricken, God has always had these people that people, what is, what is that guy God? Why is it going so good with him? Why is his cupboards full of food and nobody else has food? Why is he putting seed in the ground and nobody else has? Go to Genesis 26. Chapter 26. And there was a famine in the land. Other than the former famine that was in the days of Abram and Isaac went to Gerar and Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Now, if you go study, Egypt was a prosperous land. It was flowing with everything. Live in the land which I will tell you. Dwell temporary in this land and I will be with you. I will favor you with blessings. Okay, here's God speaking. Somebody help. For to you and to your descendants, I will give all these lands. I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham. God said to Abraham, I'm going to bless you. Now God appears to Isaac and says, I'm going to bless you. This is my plan. I want to bless you. I will make your descendants to multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give your posterity all these lands, kingdoms by your offspring. Shall all the nations of the earth be blessed? Or by him bless themselves? Verse 6. So Isaac, Isaac, Isaac stayed in Gerar. Verse 12. Then Isaac sowed seed in that land. Okay. Which land did he sow seed in? Famine land. I mean, the Philistines were the rich guys. And what did they do? If you read the chapter, the Bible says they sat on their sacks. And they said, we can't sow this year. Because there's been no rain and the ground cannot be plowed. But Isaac sowed in the land and received in the same year hundred times as much as he had planted. And the Lord, please, favored him with blessings. Verse 13, and the man became rich, your Bible say great, and gained more and more until he became very wealthy and distinguished. When Abram listened and sowed in famine land, God said he became rich till he became very rich, till he became very wealthy, so wealthy that he was distinguished from all the other people on the earth. Verse 18. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which has been dug in the days of Abram, his father. You know, there were no wells. I'm not going to read the story. So there were no wells. There were no wells. There were no water. There were no water. Verse 26. Then Abimelech went to him from Geror with Ahuza, one of his friends. You see, Ahuza, Machahila, Ayla, Pichol, with his army's commander. They were all there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And Isaac said to him, why have you come to me, seeing that you hate me and have sent me away from you? Listen to what the Philistines said. We saw that the Lord was certainly with you. So we said, let there be now an oath between us, even between you and us, and let us make covenant with you, that you will do us no harm, inasmuch as we have not touched you and have done you nothing but good and have sent you away in peace. You are the blessed and the favored of the Lord. 
verse 32. That same day, Isaac's servants came and told him the well that they had dug, saying, we have found water. God wants you to prosper even in times of famine. Did you see it there? So what must you do even in time of famine? So. But Kubas, this is seed, man. And we're talking about financial breakthrough. All right, let's go to 2 Corinthians 9 to pick up our point there. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Remember this. He who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also reap sparingly and grudgingly. He who sows generously so that blessings may come to succumb to someone will also reap generously and with blessings. Okay? Look at chapter 9, just for those who think, you know, maybe not in context. Look at verse 1. Verse 1 says, now about the offering. Okay, are you there? So he calls that seed, sowing. Okay? Look at verse 10. Oh man, verse 10 is an awesome verse. It says, now he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed that is sown and will increase the fruit of your righteousness. Okay, man, God says, it's only sowers that will be able to get seed. Because if you're not a sower, what do you want to do with seed? God not only wants you to prosper in a famine, God wants to warn you before the famine comes. Then he wants to bless you in the famine, through the famine, and exalt you after the famine to prove to the people that you were warned about the famine because you were a blessed person. Second Kings chapter 8. Point number eight, warning before trouble to protect and bless you in, through, and after trouble. The Bible says, if calamity comes and destruction come, it shall not even come near you. When the word destruction is named, it shall not even come over your lips. You will only see the reward of the wicked, but nothing shall touch you, nothing shall hurt you, nothing shall... Oh, because I'm not for this prosperity gospel. Well, do you have another gospel? Did God promise you abundance? Did he promise the Israelites a land flow with milk and honey? Quick, can anybody help me? Why were they in the wilderness? Was it God or was it them? Oh. Okay, chapter 8. Now, Elisha, Elisha spoke to the woman which son he had restored to life, saying, Arise, go to your household, sojourn wherever you can sojourn. For the Lord has called for a famine, and it shall come upon the land seven years. The woman arose and did after the saying of the man of God, and she went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. And it came to pass at the seven years' end that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines. She went forth to cry unto the king for her house and for her land. I mean, how arrogant can you get? God wanted to go to the land of prosperity while her land was in poverty. After seven years, she come back. Now she wants her house back. And the king talked with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God. Listen, now Gehazi is Elisha's servant. The king talked to the man of God saying, Tell me, I pray you, all the great things that Elisha has done. This king was interested in miracles. And it came to pass as he was telling the king how he had restored a dead body to life. That behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life cried to the king for her house and for her land. And the guy said, O my Lord, O king, this is the woman and this is the son whom Elisha restored to life. When the king asked the woman, she told him. So the king appointed her a certain officer saying, Restore all that was hers and all the fruit of the field since the day that she left the land even until now. Man, this thing shocked me, rocked my boat, 
nine, ten years ago when I read it, I said, Lord, would you tell me why this woman could leave her land, go to a land of plenty, when her own land is in famine? Then she lives on the fat of the land for seven years. Her buddies are struggling for seven years. She comes back after seven years with my ass. The story was this woman whose son was raised to dead. So you've got to understand where the son comes from. Elisha came past this Shunammite woman and she beheld and saw that this was a holy man of God. And she said to her husband, let's sow in his ministry. And then Elisha said, what can we do for you? She said, nothing. I'm rich and influential. And his servant came and said, uh, she, hasn't got a, she hasn't got a child. Her husband's old. So Elisha prophesied a son. We know the son died. Elisha raised him to dead. And this is where the king tells, picks up the story. He says, is this the woman? Then this must be the woman that sowed into Elisha's life. This must be the woman that sustained him, built him the house, brought him the table. Oh man, give her everything that she wanted, everything that she had, plus give her seven years of harvest in one day. Okay? So God will warn you about famine. God will protect you in the famine and God will restore you after the famine because you were prepared to sow into fruitful ministries. She saw he was a fruitful ministry, a holy man of God. She saw he was whatever you want to put in there and she sowed and was blessed. Point number 10, are you there? If you see a godly vision, Share in it, and it will prosper you. Okay, now remember we are talking about your financial breakthrough. Your pro- if you see a godly vision, now you know Proverbs twenty nine eighteen says, where there is no vision, people perish. So where there is a vision, people will prosper. Okay, no vision, perish. Plenty vision, prosper. Okay? You saw, you see us here on satellite preaching to you all across the world. Do you think that's vision? Why do you think we're doing what we're doing? Because people see it's a true vision. We're not talking and not doing. What we say is happening. When we said we're going to start the TV station, we started it three and a half years ago. Okay? When we said we're going to new, uh, build our new building, we're building our new building. When we said we started a school 20 years ago, we started a school 20 years ago. Okay? When we said we're starting a Bible school, we started a Bible school. And everything is prospering. Everything is successful. Where there's no vision, people perish. So the point is, you've got to share somebody's vision that's godly to prosper in your own life. Exodus 35. Okay, Moses comes down from the mountain. His face is shining, you know. And God gave him a vision to build a tabernacle for God's presence. So he shares the vision. Man and the people got excited. They said, Moses. Verse 29. And the Israelites brought a free will offering to the Lord. All men and women whose hearts made them willing and moved them to bring anything for any of the work which the Lord had commanded by Moses. Moses had the vision, the people were moved, and they brought the offerings. Okay? First Chronicles, or Second Chronicles chapter 31. I want to show you how you can be blessed out of that. And they brought burnt offerings, peace offerings to minister, to give thanks and to praise in the gates of the camp of the Lord. King Hezekiah's personal contribution was for the burnt offering. As soon, verse 5, as the command went abroad, the Israelites, the Israelites, the people, gave in abundance. First fruits of grain, vintage fruit, oil, honey. See, they brought anything they could bring. Produce of the field and they brought in abundantly the tithe as well. Do you see that? So the people of Israel and Judah who lived in Judah's city also brought the tithe of cattle, sheep, dedicated things, okay, which were consecrated in the Lord their God and they laid them in heaps. In the third month at the end of the wheat harvest, they began to lay the foundation, beginning the heaps and finish them in the seventh month. When Hezekiah and the princes came and saw the heaps, they blessed the Lord and his people Israel. Then Hezekiah, listen to this, this is the guy who started the offering. This is the guy who had the offerings laid in heaps. And he knew what it was for. It was for building. Look at me. It was for a vision to build. So now they finished what they had to do. So here comes Hezekiah back. He was some kind some, some of journey or something. And he saw the heaps. Now he questioned the heaps because he got the heap offering to use in the Lord's work. 
Now he's shocked. What's the heaps? We're supposed to have spent the heaps. He said, and when Hezekiah came and he saw the heaps, they blessed the Lord and his people Israel. Then Hezekiah questioned the priest about the heaps. Why? Because he got it to spend. And Azariah, the high priest of the house of Zadok, answered him, Since the people began to bring the offerings into the Lord's house, we have eaten. We have plenty left. For the Lord has blessed his people. And what is left is this great store. So here comes Hezekiah and says, man, we're going to start a heap offering. I'll be first. Let's bring our money. So the people start bringing money and the heaps got bigger, bigger. So Hezekiah says, well, you know what to do in the Lord's house. Use the money, use it wisely. So here goes Hezekiah. He comes back and here's the heaps. He says, hey, yo, what, is that? what are the heaps doing here? Are they supposed to be? They say, hey, hey, hey. Since the people started with the offerings, they are so blessed. We are all blessed. We have all eaten. We have plenty. All of us have now plenty. And these are not the heaps that you gathered. This is the heaps that's left over after everybody's blessed. What if the church gets there? So if you catch on to a vision that a man of God brings and you start supporting the vision, God says you'll be so blessed that you'll keep on bringing because you'll have too much. Is that all right? 1 Kings 17. Always put God first in finances. Okay, let's read. 1 Kings 17. Arise, get to Zarephath. There is a widow. I commanded her to sustain you. And as he came to Zarephath, there was this woman gathering sticks. Now, this was in a time of a drought, three and a half year drought. And Elijah called her and said, fetch me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she went to fetch it, he said, bring me, I pray you, a little morsel of bread. And she said, as truly as the Lord thy God live, I have not a cake but a handful of meal in a barrel, little oil in a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks. I always say that that must be a big fire, two sticks. That I may go and I'll show you how little the, 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 the you know, you know, what was she ever had? Okay. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do. But she, she listened to her confession, confession. I'm going to make this bread so that we can eat and die. And Elijah said to her, Fear not, go and do as you have said, but make me thereof a little cake first and bring it to me first. And then go and make for you and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the battle of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sent rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, she and he and her house did eat many days. The battle of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord which he spoke by Elijah. Everybody says first. first. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4 says the following, by faith. Abel brought a better sacrifice than Cain. Now you know the story. Why couldn't Cain brought a better one? Because he was not Abel. Okay. <laughs> Abel brought a better sacrifice than Cain. And the Bible says, and though he be dead, yet he speaks. What speaks? The fact that he brought an offering. So if the offering still speaks today, we've got to find out what this offering says. So if we go to the book of Genesis chapter 3, it says, a day came when Cain brought offerings unto the Lord out of his flock. No, out of the land. And then Abel came and he brought, brought the first out of his flock. And God spoke to me and said, Abel understood that you first offered to God before you look after somebody else. And God says, that is what happened with the woman there with Elijah. Elijah, bring me first. First God, God stuff. And then God look after your house. Bank in heaven so that when you ask from God, he can supply your needs. Save not up for yourself treasures on earth. If that is true, what I just said, 
no one of you must have anything. If you not must have anything, then why all the scriptures on prosperity? If God don't want you to have anything, why do we bother to preach about stuff? If the Bible says God didn't spare his own son, how will he not more, more freely give us all things? It says if you seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, all the other things will be added unto you. If God don't want you to have things, why would he put a scripture like that in? So we've got to understand in the right perspective. So, don't get yourself a lot of treasures on earth. Oh, oh, that second car in your garage. Oh, you know, and people get on a guilt trip. No, get it in context. But gather up for yourself treasures in heaven. Now, the context here in Matthew 6 and in Luke 12 is, don't gather up for your treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt. Okay? Now, this money don't really rust. Neither does the moth really eat them. In James chapter 5, God says, all the rich people better watch out. Your riches are moth-eaten and rust-corrupted. Because the wages that you're supposed to give to your workers is crying out against you. You didn't give the people what they nearly really deserved. It's very quiet now. Well, I'm not going to give him more. No, he's getting enough. Did you know how he works? That's all right. You know where he comes from? We picked him up in the street and made him something. I'm not going to give him more money. God says that money of the laborers is crying out. It qualifies your money as moth-eaten and rust-corrupted. Okay, point number two. Let's go on with that. It says, uh, so gather up for yourself tre- treasures in heaven where it doesn't corrupt. So how do I gather treasures in heaven? Okay. So, if I put money in the bank, I have money, I go put it in the bank. Better my health for me. Because the Anakan Makwas is my plus, better my health. Can I say my money? You'd be surprised how people come with bags of money that don't know how to work money. Okay, so here comes guy. So he banks money in the bank. So there's now money in the bank. In turn for the money, they give him a card. They say, it'll make it easier for you. It's not the mark of the beast. It'll make it easier for you. (laughs) So you don't have to stand in a long queue. You can go anytime, night and day. So I got my card. So I go to the machine and I put the card in, put my number in, and and when I put my, and I want money, the machine says, whish, 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 and I get the money back. Yeah. (laughs) But some people got a card someday when they had something in there. But before the fifth of the month, they spend it all. And they know they spend it. Now they go to that little machine. They think this thing is stupid. They think this thing can't think. So we come to God. You say, now we know we got to do tithings, first fruits, sacrifices, sowing. So we come, Father, dear Father. We come, brother, would you agree with me? I need 2,000 rand urgently. If I don't pay it now, they're going to put me out of my house tonight. Oh, let's agree, brother. Father, we agree with our brother. In the name of the Lord Jesus, God, he needs 2,000 urgently. God, if he doesn't pay the money, he's going to be put out of the house. God, you know, he's your child. He's blood washed. Oh, Lord, he's your child. He belongs to you. God, God says, just check his account. Here comes the angels back. They say, uh, well, he hasn't been tithing for four years. Uh, you know, the last three offerings he refused to give because he's fed up with the pastor. And you know, when it comes to first fruits, he's never given first fruits. You know, he gives you half the month. You know, God says, oh, tell him he, he, he just, uh, he's going to be put out of the house. <laughs> I'm not ugly. Do you think God is an idiot? Do you think the ATM is wiser than almighty God? If that ATM knows you've got no money in the bank, do you think God doesn't know you didn't give anything to the work of the Lord? Oh, but Kubas, I'm poor. Well, there's there's about four poor widows in the church, in the Bible. 
that got blessed because they gave. There's one that gave all that she had and she's remembered in the Bible because she gave all that she had. Point number 13. Get back to you. God will supply all your needs. Not according to some bank, according to his riches. How rich do you think God is? He's the owner of the universe. How rich do you think God is? He says, he will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. What is that? Philippians 4.19. Verse 13 is a good one. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But what does verse 14 through 19 say? Let's go, Philippians. Verse 14. It was right and commendable and noble of you to contribute for my needs and to share my difficulties. Can you see that? And you Philippians shall well know that in the early days of the gospel ministry when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me and opened up a debit and credit account and giving and receiving except you only. Come on, there it is. For in Thessalonica you sent me contributions for my needs not only once but a second time. Not that I seek or am eager for your gift, but I do seek and I am eager for the fruit which increases to your credit. The harvest of blessing that's accumulating to your account. Amen. And my God will liberally supply all your needs. Now at this point, there's a couple of people in this house that I've given this point to. And the people that used it, God blessed by that. The people that refused it, suffered under it. At times, you've got to lose to gain. Okay? It works like this. You have something where somebody pays, must pay you money. A month. So say I've got 200 people that comes to a course that I present. And they got to each pay for the six months that I present the course, they got to pay 100 rand a month. But now some of them don't pay the 100 rand a month. So at the end of the course, we say, uh, sir, you still owe your 600 rand for the course. He says, I haven't got it. The other ones say, oh, well, I don't know, you know, sure, we've been going through a tough time lately. And before you know it, everybody is enemies with everybody. Because that one is guilty, he didn't pay. But because of his guiltiness of not paying, he gets offended towards you, and now he stays away and he doesn't come anymore. But it's his fault. Now I go and I say, uh, you owe 600. I tell you what, pay 200 and we'll write it off. The guy says, wow, I'll get that somewhere. If you didn't do it, you would have had an enemy and you would have lost the money. Now you did it, you gain a friend, at least you got 200 of the 600. Now, this doesn't give you a key to come become wicked. I'm just telling you how stuff works. Okay, let's read on. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in least is also unjust in much. Verse 9 says, it's money. If you are faithful in little, you will be faithful in lot. So this is what God is saying. If you, if, you, if you are faithful when you have the ten, you will be faithful when you have the millions. People come with a saying and say, Kubis, when, as soon as God bless me in my business, I'm really going to give to the work of the Lord. You lie. You know you lie. Because as soon as you prosper, you forget God. That's biblical principles. If you don't give now, you will not give when you're rich. You've got to give now when you haven't got so breakthrough when you have a lot. Okay? Be faithful. In little. I'll just put it the right connection. God will entrust you. With much. Okay? This is all points to make you prosper, people. This is all points to make you prosper. Okay? Mm, verse 11 to 13. If you have been faithful in unrighteous moments, who will not commit you true riches? Okay, 
uh, verse 13, no servant can serve two masters. He will hate the one, love the other, or will hold to the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Okay? No, cannot serve God and money. Okay. Uh, I want to add to that point. Uh, we made a t-shirt, or busy making a t-shirt now, said money works for me. It works like this. If you pass a shop and you want to buy this nice pulpit. Then you go and you say, how much does it cost? And they say, 12,000 US dollars. So you go to the bank, put all your cards out, you put your checkbook out, you put all your money out, and you bow, you say, oh money, am I able to buy the pulpit? Money says, no way, it's too much. Have you ever seen, if you ask what the price is, it's always been too much? Yeah. Come on. How many times have you asked for a price? Why do you ask the price? Because you know you're not going to buy it. Yeah. <laughs> Get your mind set. Okay. On what? God wants you blessed. Be you're going to give. Come on, if you set your mind on that. Now, in Luke chapter 12, verse 29, the same context is Matthew 6, where he says, lay up treasures in heaven. The same context that says Solomon was clothed and you're going to be better clothed. The same context, Jesus said, do not be of a doubtful mind. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 12. For the, if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according that the man has. And not according to that he has not. Verse 19. And not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us with his grace, which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord and declaration of your ready mind. So Paul says, you know, when it comes to giving, you must have a willing mind. You remember there in Exodus? And you must have a ready mind. Chapter 9. Verse 2, for I am well acquainted with your willingness. There it is. Now chapter 10, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations in your mind, and every eye thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all the disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Point number 18. How many has got credit cards? Everybody. So you use the money without having it. You're actually using the bank's money, trusting that you'll have money to pay at the end of the month. Sometimes you've got to borrow to prosper. Second Kings chapter 8, there was this widow whose sons wanted to be taken by the government because she couldn't, couldn't pay her debts. Elisha said to her, go borrow vessels and borrow not too few. And then take your little oil and fill up these vessels. And she had enough money to look after her household, her sons, and everybody around her because she was prepared to go and borrow to see her through her need. Okay, open your Bible to Galatians 6 and uh, Ezekiel 44. Point number 19, don't forget to bless the man that teaches you the word of God. Galatians 6, verse 6, let him who receives instruction in the word Share all things with his teacher, contributing to his support. Because God is not deceived. Only what a man sows, that is what he will reap. Ezekiel 44. And the first of all the first fruits of all kinds. And every offering of all kinds from all your offerings shall belong to the priest. You shall also give the priest the first of your coarse meal and bread, dough, so that a blessing may rest on your house. God says, this will bless your house. Mm -hmm. 
Point number 20, the last one. Ah. Be ready for the surprise of abundance and the overflow. Amos 9.13 Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. And the mountains shall drop seed wine and the hills shall melt. This is the word of the Lord. The time will come when you give, you will not know are you giving to get or giving because you got. The flow will be so great and so marvelous so that when you put into offering, you will not be able to discern, is this because I want or is this because I got? Because the overflow will be so great, you will be just a giver.